Thank you. Forward. All right. Hey, guys. How's everyone feeling? Awesome. So thank you for that warm and warm welcome. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you guys. It's always one of my greatest joys is to be in the conversation. You know what I mean? Like to really talk about what matters and what's, what feels deep and what brings us together as community and allows us to recognize who we are and what we stand for in the world. And so I want to actually start by acknowledging this incredible team a Creative Mornings because they are all volunteers and they're all working their jobs and trying to make this happen and juggling the world to bring this to all of us and to our community. So let's give them some love real quick. <laughs> yeah, it feels really important to acknowledge that. So I'm super honored to be here and um, to have this conversation. And it's interesting uh, that the theme today is invest. Um, last month, we had the theme of roots. And as a deep ecologist, I thought, wow, like that's totally where I resonate. So then coming into the theme of invest was an invitation for me to sit with what does that really mean to me? And so this was a question that I recognized. What has life invested in you? And how are you investing your life? And this is definitely something that I've been sitting with my entire life, you know, and to really notice um, what it is that I'm learning through life. What are the deep kind of wisdom nuggets, right, that life has imbued in me? And what has that done in, in me? How has that moved in me and allowed me to stand up in this world for something larger than myself, which is how am I investing my life? And so what I'm going to share today is a little bit about that journey. And so I love this quote from Mary Oliver. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I mean, we're here. And it's such a great mystery that's given birth to this incredible unfolding uh, evolutionary journey that's brought us here to this moment. Yeah, Jenny, thank you. Cut that. And so this question, this has been part of my journey for so long. You know, what do I stand for? What am I doing with my life? What does it really mean to be human? What does it mean to be me as a human and how I relate to the world around me? And so, like many great stories in our lives, um, it began with a really huge heartbreak that set me on this path and invited me into a deeper inquiry. And I think that in our lives, we get so much information out of those most challenging moments, right? Those dark nights of the soul, the times when we don't know who we are in this moment and something is shifting inside of us and what does this experience have to teach me or what does this moment have to teach me or what does this lesson have to teach me and how do I move forward as a new person with new awareness because of this experience, not in spite of it. And so for me, this began with a huge heartbreak. I'm in my 40s right now and in my early mid-20s, I was in a relationship. And I was with this really amazing partner, my boyfriend at the time, who had just started on, on this path that I'm about to share with you. And he was very passionate about it and invited me to watch a video to share a little bit about what felt important to him. He wanted me to see something that he felt I wasn't seeing. And so we sat down one day and he put on this video of um, behind the scenes footage of a circus. And in this video, there was a depiction of an elephant being beaten with a bull hook. So sorry, this is gonna get a little heavy, but this was my experience. And I sat there watching this, and this, I, I mean, this beautiful elephant, right? Being beaten into submission with a huge chain around his leg. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing because I grew up going to circuses like many of us, right? How many people have gone to circuses through your life, right? Maybe still do. And or brought your kids or bring your kids, right? And so for me, like I loved riding on the elephant, right? We would ride around in a circle and it felt really fun and connecting and, you know, it was a great time for me. And when I saw that, it just whoo, kind of blew my mind because I had never really thought about the elephant. I never thought about what that animal was experiencing or where they came from or how they were being treated or anything like that. And I got really quiet, you know, but inside I could feel my heart just breaking for that 
other animal, this other living being. Like, what are we doing as humans? And then he showed me another video. And this was a video of a slaughterhouse. Again, like, I never thought about it. And here I am seeing these animals that are kept in deplorable conditions. I mean, it's sick. It's, it's the apathy of the people that are supposed to be caring for them, the way they're crowded into cages, the way they're treated. It's not like they're living this free life and then it comes time and they, you know, they, they kill them and honor them and we eat them. It's not like that. It's so horrible. Their whole experience is just as an instrument. And it felt really intense for me to, to see that and to feel that in my heart because I grew up eating meat, I grew up eating animals, and I never thought about where they come from. I never thought about their life experience. And it really, again, just like, holy bleep. It was like, how? how? How are we doing this? How did I never think about this? You know, what else am I not thinking about? What else do I not know? You know, what else is going on in this like background of how we think the world is supposed to be that I'm not thinking about? And it just got me into such a, an, a deep space of inquiry. And woo, then he showed me another video. Yeah, and this one was um, animal like uh, testing and how we use them in labs, right, for products, for psychology, for all kinds of things. And it was really hard. You know, it was so hard. Like, my heart was broken open. Like, I can, even right now talking about it, like, I can just feel that feeling coming right back to me of just seeing these beautiful faces suffering and these poor animals, right? And so what happened for me in that space was that this shift, this first thing that I'm going to share with you, that life invested in me, imbued in me, this quality that life brought to me, was this awareness, this expanded sense of perception, a new way of seeing the world, a way that I had never seen before. And I could not unsee it. It was like, there was no way I could pretend that that wasn't true or that wasn't happening anymore. And something in me really shifted. And I had to sit with this sort of uh, something, there's a, there's a term for it, it's called positive disintegration. Positive disintegration is this space that we move into where our worldview begins to crumble, right? Our sense of what we think is true and right and how we relate to the world literally crumbles apart. And we're left flailing in this chaotic darkness going, what the hell's going on? Who am I now? How do I stand forward? What, what's my next step with this new information about me and my relationship to, to life? And in this case, it was my relationship to other animals, non-human animals, because humans are also animals, right? So this, I sat with this. And it's a positive disintegration because what emerges from it is a better version of ourselves, a more, in, a more uh, authentic and in integrity with who we feel we are and the way we're showing up, right? And so that's what happened for me, is I, I sat in this and I was like, how do I move forward from here? Like, what is that? What does that look like for me? And now in my life up until this point, I, I, I've always been a leader. Like I have had this quality in me. It's a natural thing like, that I was attracted to, standing up and taking leadership. And it looked very different until this point in my life. And now I sat with, well, what does me as a leader look like with this information. And so I took the next step. And the next step for me was getting active, turning hope into a verb. Because hope is not a passive noun. Hope is something we do. It's something we stand for. It's actions that we take to make a difference and, and really embody what it is that we stand for. And so in this moment, I did just that. And I decided to get involved in animal rights. That was where I was at that point in my life, in my early 20s. I became an animal rights activist. And I'm proud to say that because there's a lot of stuff that surrounds this idea of animal rights. We think of radicalists. We think of all kinds of things associated with that. But I'm going to tell you, it's an invitation to stand for something that felt really important for me at that moment in my life. So I got involved in campaigns. Um, I started leading some campaigns. And I started showing up. And then one day, Tim was my partner at the time. Tim and I were invited to step into some civil disobedience, right? Um, which is really kind of taking some action that may not totally be in alignment with the law, but we know it's for a better cause and it feels important, 
right? So I like to say we were compassionate troublemakers, you know? Uh -huh. A term that has stayed with me until this moment, all my life. Um, but so we got involved, and we got involved in a campaign at the Miami Seaquarium. How many of you guys have been there? A couple of you, not that many. I'm glad to hear that, actually. <laughs> um, so we were invited. It was a Mother's Day demonstration, a protest that was happening outside the Seaquarium. And this was really the start of so much in my life. And we were invited to actually be one of the chosen few, uh, maybe five or six of us, that went inside to this aquarium and stood up during the Lolita show, right? Lolita is the longest living captive orca in the world who's been in this aquarium now over 40 years. At this time, it was around, I guess, around 30. And so we were going to go into this aquarium, go into the show, and then during the show, stand up and start saying what needed to be said, right? So we went, we went inside, and we saw Lolita, right? Um, and this is a show that I had gone to. I had been brought to the Sequarium as a child. Um, I ran down to those first couple rows to get splashed and have a great time getting wet uh, and be entertained without knowing or thinking about anything different. My parents taught me. They taught me. They took me. They taught me, right? All of that. So I, I went there, and I saw Lolita. Uh, and this time, it looked really different. She looked really different. The situation looked really different to me. And when I walked in, I saw her here, you know, just kind of lifelessly, just totally still, just hanging out quietly, alone, in this tank. This tiny tank that is literally illegal by government standards. That's a whole other story, but it's also part of my story. Um, and I looked at her, and man, my heart, I, I felt totally, I was in such empathy with her, imagining her life, imagining what it must be like in between shows, right? And even during the shows, where people are writing on her face, and you know, they keep her hungry before the show, so they feed her dead fish. So there's no hunting involved, right? And she is literally like just there, just there for our entertainment. And they say it's education, but the reality is the show's about 20 minutes, people get splashed, and uh, we're taught that it's okay to dominate animals, right? To take them from their natural wild environment and use them for entertainment. And so this is what I saw. This is what I saw. And in my heart, I wanted to see this. I wanted to see this. You know, Lolita was captured when she was about five years old from Puget Sound. And she was literally torn away from her family, who was on the other side of the net, screaming for her. And even after she was taken out of the water, they stayed for days, crying and calling to her. And she was taken to the Miami Seaquarium and at first put in the manatee tank, where her tail was literally coming out of the water. And then they built this, that tiny enclosure for her that she just swims around and around and around. That's her life for decades and decades. And man, I saw this, and it was just intense. So what we did is we went in. We went into the show, and we sat there. And then there's a moment where they turned down this blaring music. Uh, so you can hear her talk. You can hear her dialect. You can hear her language. So that moment, they turned down the music. And we all eyeball each other from different parts in the stadium, right? We're like spread out throughout the stadium. And we stand up and we take off our overshirts and we're wearing this free Lolita shirt. And we all start talking. We're like, She's, she, she belongs in the wild and she was torn from her family and she, you know, she doesn't belong in this tank and all, on and on. Everything we could pour out of our hearts, right? And we had one person there with a video camera videotaping it. And so the guards start coming up and we're like walking, you know, we're like dancing through the aisles and we're running down the aisles and we're like talking and talking and running away from the guards and it was quite a spectacle, <laughs> you can imagine. Um, but man, a lot of passion. And then a lot of people really annoyed because we were ruining their show. And I felt that too. There was a lot of things going on that day. So eventually they caught up with us. You can only dance around the aisles for so long. <laughs> And they escorted us, I will do that in parentheses, out, because they actually threw Tim down the stairs and dragged him, which later became a lawsuit. That's another story. Um, but they took us out. And man, we were like whoo, on fire. You can imagine what that felt like. Adrenaline rush, like standing for something big, doing something illegal, like all that stuff was happening at that moment. Um, and so we went out. And we went out knowing we had that on video. And we looked at each other and we said, we're making a documentary film. And we did. And we got some interviews, and we began to follow her story. 
And we created Rattle the Cage Productions, which is a nonprofit organization that we created in the early 2000s, around 2001 or 2. And we followed her story. We created the documentary Lolita Slave to Entertainment. Is my hand in the way? <laughs> Thank you. So we created Lolita Slave to Entertainment. We followed her story. We revealed so many things that were happening behind the scenes at the Miami Sea Aquarium. We cost them billions of dollars in investor support. So much stuff was happening. And we were supercharged. And so this was our first film. Um, after that, we, we departed as partners. And he continued on making films. Rattle the Cage is still there. Um, and I continued on my path. And what I learned, the second thing that life invested in me, was my compassion a deep sense of compassion for life. And this is, it's hard to read, but this is a quote from the Dalai Lama that says, our prime purpose in this life is to help others. And if you can't help them, at least don't hurt them. And I love that, right? So here I am, my heart, like my per perception of life expanded, my sense of compassion expanded, and it didn't stop there. All of a sudden, I started really diving into, well, what does this mean? My relationship to non-human animals. What about the ecosystem of the earth? What about river, mountain, you know, the, the toxicity of our planet? What's happening with the, the rainforest? You know, what's going on with the deforestation? Like, this is painful. What else is happening? And that led me on a deeper inquiry. And I ended up going to graduate school for deep ecology and ecology. And I started taking groups out into wildness to remember who we are as earth, our connection to life our larger body. And so I did this work of deep ecology and became a professor at Florida International University. And outside of, of the university, I was you know, doing workshops, doing speaking engagements. From the documentary, it started my speaking platform really around the world because we, did, we won a lot of awards at film festivals. I began speaking to conferences, groups, colleges, all over the place. And here, it went deeper. So now, instead of just talking about the marine park industry and animals and entertainment, it expanded to who are we? How do we connect with the earth as our larger body? And when we remember that and we fall in love with life because it really became an invitation to fall deeper in love with who I am and who we are and how we show up in a larger way. And here is just like this invitation to feel into and embody this work. So it's deeply experiential work, embodied deep ecology. For those of you not familiar with the term deep ecology, it's this philosophy of our interconnectedness with life. It takes a look at us as not just this egocentric, which is that picture on your left, where the humans kind of sit on top of the world with a crown and, and scepter and rule the world, and everything's here for us, but rather reminds us that we are part of the web of life. We're interconnected with life. We're interdependent with life. And the choices that we make as a human species affect the entire world. And this became my main platform for speaking, for education, for workshops, for events that I was doing, like this deeper conversation about who we are. And this began to expand as I started working with this incredible elder. Her name's Joanna Macy. And around 2007, I worked with Joanna. She created the work that reconnects, which is all about helping us remember our deeper connection to life and through that being invited to stand up in our world as activists for change on a much larger level. No, it's like our, our ecosystem, our world is changing and shifting and we can see the systems crumbling apart because business as usual models are not working and we have to rethink how, how who we are as humans and our culture, right? Who we are as wildness and our culture, how we can co-evolve, right? So it's not just economics at any cost. It's like people, planet, profit, right? We need to put it all together to that triple bottom line. And so working with Joanna was life-changing for me, and it really allowed me to deepen and expand my sense of self. Right? So now it's not just about me and my close friends or how I'm relating to other humans. It's not just about how I relate to other animals. And it's not even about just how I relate to the earth. Because I started thinking about that too. Like here we are, this global planet, and everything's interconnected, this beautiful web of life. And also, our earth is not in a bubble. We exist inside of this universe, this vast, incredible, mysterious universe that 13.7 billion years ago exploded from mystery. Call it God, call it anything you want. We literally can. 
We're storytellers. We can interpret that any way. But what we know from science is that for 13.7 billion years, we have had an evolutionary unfolding that has fundamentally shifted our ability to know ourselves. And universes, stars, right? Everything, galaxies are created. Earth was created. The first single cell was created. Multi-celled organisms, jellyfish, sponges, right? Uh, fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals. And once upon a time, we stood upright in the savanna and we saw ourselves. We became self-reflexive, curious about ourselves. We began exploring who we are. And evolution took an inward turn into consciousness. And we've been evolving. Consciousness has been evolving for millions of years, like, and hundreds of thousands of years in the human form. Like, we are literally the mystery that gave birth to the universe. Feel that. When we really feel into that, how does that expand your sense of self? Who we are is so powerful as both the intelligence of the universe and as our unique differentiated selves, the way that we show up in the world. And so this became an invitation for me to explore what we call the universe story. This is our modern cosmology based in the science of the universe. And I started studying with this incredible man, Dr. Brian Swim, studying his work. Um, and he says, the earth was once molten rock and now sings operas. Things are always evolving. We are part of this evolutionary journey. And that sense of self, wow, how powerful that is. Because we are not insignificant things. We are so powerful. And each one of us is so incredibly unique. And so that deepened my sense of spiritual maturity, psychological maturity, what it means to be human in this world, how to show up as not just myself, but as this greater sense of self, knowing that when I show up, it's not just from me, it's through me. It's through the intelligence of everything that's ever been because life continues to, to teach us, to evolve in us, to invest in us this deep sense of wisdom. It's in our DNA and it's in our life experience. And I love this quote from Tom Yeomans. He says, the stunning paradox of human spiritual maturity is that as we become one with all life, we also at the same time become completely and uniquely ourselves. So the more we understand our interconnectedness with life, the sense of oneness, right, the sense of incredible empowerment, knowing that who we are is so much larger than ourselves, the more confidence we gain to step into ourselves fully and wholly and bring our unique way of being into the world through what life has invested in us. And man, no two, two of us are the same, right? Every person has different fingerprints. Right? The, zebra of every, uh, the, the stripes of every zebra are completely unique. Every living being is unique by design. And we're meant to be a unique expression of this great mystery. And so whatever life has invested in you through your experience and through your journey, the invitation is to say, how can I now invest my life and stand for something larger than myself, give myself to the world. And so my ability to serve from humility and from this greater sense of how we move forward collectively, evolutionarily, has deepened and taken a total another, another level in my life. I've been able to speak on huge platforms, connect with so many different people. I've been creating mindful living events on large levels you know, for 20 years now, and literally have affected the life, informed the life, inspired the lives of thousands of people. And it's been amazing as a messenger, as, a, as, a ser as in service to this world, to take all that life has invested in me and be able to stand for this and invest it back into the world so that we get to evolve collectively and together. And so this is the last thing I want to share. And this is from Matt Licata. And it's kind of a wrap up of everything we're talking about and how we can really be here for each other. And I'm going to come over here to read it. He says, perhaps in the end, our life's purpose has nothing to do with what, create, what career we create, what new thing we'll manifest or attract for ourselves, or how successful we are in manifesting life. Perhaps the purpose of our life is to fully live, finally, to touch each here and now with our presence, our warmth, our mercy, and with the gift of our one wild heart, and to do whatever we can to help others, to hold them when they're hurting, to listen carefully to their stories, and to face their attempting to make sense of a world that's gone a bit mad. To speak kind words to them and not forget 
the miracle of each other as it appears in front of us. Perhaps this is the most radical gift we can give the world and to share the gifts that we have been given. And so with that, I'm just going to bring you to this space where I am to this day. You know, I started Psycho Spiritual Institute about four years ago, and it's literally the culmination of all these incredible things that life has imbued in, in me. It's the activism, it's the ecology, it's spiritual psychology, it's the powerful invitation for us to stand for, stand for our world as guides. That as we become more present to who we are and what we stand for in the world, we get to stand up and make a difference as activists, as change makers, and as leaders. Because our world needs aware and awakened leaders. The way we lead our lives creates a ripple effect into the world. And when we stand for something larger than ourselves, we together collectively create an evolutionary force that cannot be stopped. And in that way, we get to lead our world forward. And that's my invitation to all of you. And I hope that my story gives you the inspiration to really look into your own life, what it is that you stand for, and how you get to make a difference. So thank you.